Okay, so uh, hello everyone and welcome to the Plain Film and CT webinar. My name is Seidel and I'm the customer success specialist at Collective Minds. Uh, before we start anything, I would, uh, I would like to say a big thank you for everyone who uh, uh, provided feedback on the last webinar. Uh, very nice comments and I really liked it, so keep, keep it coming. Uh, I can see that uh, there's a lot of new people joining today, which is amazing. And uh, for those who don't know, uh, all of you should have accounts on Collective Minds. So when you reg registered for the webinar, we asked you to fill out uh, a kind of form. And then if you pressed on yes on that form, you should have an account on, on Collective Minds. Uh, once you log in, you're going to see something that looks something like this. Uh, which is the global community that consists of 13,000 medical imaging professionals. And it's also where you will find today's cases that's uploaded right here from Imran, as you can see on the screen. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to a couple of members of Collective Minds that has uploaded cases for this webinar. So I would like to say a big thank you to Winston, that is a consultant uh, radiologist in Mexico, who has uploaded this case that uh, Imran is going to look at later. I would like to say a big thank to Cam Camari from Fiji Islands that, up, uh, that have uploaded this case. And I would like to say a big thank you to Johan Deham, who is a consultant radiologist at the Belgium. Uh, with that being said, uh, very close to the end, I'm going to send out a feedback evaluation form. Please take some time to fill that out. It really helps us provide better quality webinars for you. Uh, and one example, what we're going to introduce now is more polls, which uh, which you guys kind of liked. And I think that is it. I will send the collection link in the chat very shortly. Uh, and the collection link works as a Spotify playlist where you can put all of your favorite cases in kind of a map, pretty much, which is, uh, which is what I've done here for Imran's cases tonight. Uh, but uh, with that being said, uh, let's see if Imran Lasker is here. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've got quite a big uh, turnout today, which is absolutely amazing. I really do appreciate all the people that have come uh, who are taking part and getting involved with this um, with this webinar that we're doing and hopefully you guys are getting a lot of value. I did see some of the feedback and uh, it does blow me away that we have so many new people uh, turning up and hopefully getting some value from us. So um, hopefully you've all got the link to the, the cases. I'm gonna keep my chat open and my Q&A box open just in case any questions do come up during this. Um, if I could just get people to just give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen that I'm sharing, uh, this is going to be, or just say yes, you've seen, you can see it. So if you just tell me, as well. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good, great, thank you. So um, for those that don't know, my name is Dr. Laska. I'm a consultant radiologist. Uh, my real passion is doing teaching. I like to teach. I like to keep things interesting. Uh, hopefully, make it fun. Hopefully, you guys will be able to see that we'll be able to go through quite a few questions. Um, and then, you know, like the main thing is that we learn from one another and, you know, I don't always get it right. And I'm more than happy to uh, take criticism if I get it wrong. Uh, these are the cases that I have put up before, but, you know, you don't always get it right. And also people are, you know, putting in their own cases in. So I'll give my point of view. These are for teaching purposes only as well. So first off, um, this is Collective Minds webinar. Hopefully, um, hi everyone, I can see a few highs. Um, so Hopefully you've got access to this and this is Collective Minds. For those that don't know, please do get yourself an account if you don't use it. I use it for my own teaching and I do run courses, uh, which is on radiologyseminars.co.uk.com. And yeah, this is where we do all of our running our courses and stuff. And they a lot of kind of um, conferences thing and conferences and stuff like that are using it now. So I would highly recommend that you use it for your own teaching. Get involved in the community as well. Like there's lots of chitter chatter going on. And I've been very lucky to see kind of where Collective Minds is headed. And I'm very, very genuinely excited as to where I think it's going. And um, as a platform and as people as well, they're a really, really lovely bunch. So I'd highly recommend you check it out. So first off, um, let's start with the first case. Um, just throw in what you think it is. I'm gonna go slowly talk through it. I'm gonna have a slightly different setup today. So hopefully this works. Uh, I'll be able to draw on the screen, uh, which is a nice change, a little bit nerdy, a bit of geeky, but I hope it works. And you guys can let me know later whether this works at all. Oh, so many people, Italy, Ethiopia, Mexico, wow. Okay, welcome, welcome. So, uh, and Sweden, of course. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let's have a look at this X-ray. And um, so what we're gonna do, this is an AP film. That's, for, that's the first thing that we can see. 
And it looks like they're slightly rotated and people kind of often wonder like, what do I mean by rotation? And rotation basically means that like, you look at that spinous process, which is over there and you've got the medial ends of the clavicle, which is here. And I think that clavicle is actually all the way. I think that clavicle might be even further away. So that clavicle is there, that clavicle is there and the medial aspect of that, spin that spinous process is sitting right, right over there. So you can see the actual distance between here and here, they're, they're different, right? And it should really be um, the same as one another. And the reason is because the medial aspects of the clavicle are the most anterior aspect of the body. And the spinous process is the most posterior aspect of the body. So when they go out of line with one another, it happens sooner than if it was something that was very close by. So this is a very rotated film. It feels like that patient slightly rotated that, rotated that way. So then um, we're having a look at this x-ray and the, the things I always say, just have a general look at the x-ray, make sure that you can see, you know, is there anything obviously abnormal? For those of you that do see it, do feel free to throw in your answers. If you don't see it, then don't worry, we're gonna go through it anyway. So this, this area of lung actually looks pretty good. And you have a look at that cross phrenic angle and that looks very, very clear as well. And then this heart border, you can't see so well, right? Normally you'd be able to see the heart border probably sitting like this in the middle. We can't see that on this particular occasion because it's so rotated that I think the heart board is probably hidden somewhere over here. And you can see that heart board are probably going somewhere that way. And then, yeah, so someone's picked it up really well done. So first, of all, when you look at each side of the, the chest, this area looks slightly more radiolucent. And this looks slightly more radiopaque. And what I mean by that is that this area looks more white and this place looks more black. Therefore, there's a, like a discrepancy, a problem with the, the penetration of the film. So for whatever reason, there's increased density located within this region over here. So what could be causing that, right? So, yeah, I mean, it could be the, the, the fact that the patient's turned around so much that, yeah, you know, in theory, you could say that there is, you know, maybe you're seeing a more density of lung in this situation, but this is far too much for that, um, for, for that at all. So screen's frozen, is it? No, okay, it, so it, it's not. You can, you can continue. Okay, fine. So then um, you can see that actually there is this increased haziness that's going over this side, right? And it's almost very, very uniform. And unfortunately, because this patient is in a slightly kyphotic and rotated position, you can't really like 100% say that the hemidiaphragm is raised compared to the other. But there's definitely this sort of veil-like capacity that is sitting there. So actually, there's a pole. Um, so would you mind just sharing that pole now? So there's a specific sign for this. And if you guys can just, you know, put whatever you think it is, and we'll um, try and you know, see what people are thinking. But when you look at this, it's like a very specific sign that this can represent, right? So usually when you see something like a sail sign, you see like a like a little proper little boat, right? But you can't really see a boat in this situation. Then a golden S sign would actually be over here and that would be sort of a right upper low problem, right? But then we wouldn't have a golden S sign. It doesn't look like an S here over here. This looks like a complete sheet. So then once you've done that, you've got to start thinking about what else could it be? So continuous diaphragm sign is where you've got the diaphragm, which is over here like this, but in this situation, you can't see the diaphragm continuing. Otherwise, it would be a continuous diaphragm sign. But it's not because it kind of just stops and then carries on because there's so much soft tissue density within this region. You only have a continuous diaphragm sign if there's air in the underneath the hemidiaphragms resulting in an in interface between the soft tissue and the air itself. So this is not that. So you're left with a veil-like opacity that is sitting over here. And the veil-like opacity has happened because of a left upper lobe collapse. And what's essentially happened is that the left upper lobe has collapsed, the, the left lower lobe has kind of expanded upwards, resulting in this all veil-like opacity that we're seeing here. So don't worry, we'll get some more interesting cases coming up. Hopefully that was interesting enough just to weigh appetite. Now, if we go to the next case, so let's see what the results were. So everyone did quite well there, actually. So very, very good. And hopefully I've explained to everyone why, um, why it wasn't that. So quite a few people, 90% of people said that was a veil sign. So perfect, well done. Okay, so let's open this one. Okay, so we can share results if anyone is uh, interested. Uh, so now we can have a look at this. Uh, this is case number two. And these things can be quite challenging. So what we can do is I, I was trying to zoom in and then I just have a good look around the entire bone, right? Just have a good look around everywhere. Try and see if you can figure out, you know, what, what the problem is. Is there any particular issues anywhere here? And then what I do is get my pen out and I genuinely, genuinely, I draw all the way around like so, like draw all the way around and make sure that everything is nice and smooth. Now, the thing is, I'd always say is try and make sure that you do take account of the soft tissues, right? And I've seen this time and time again, where people have sort of thought, oh, okay, you know what, I think there's a fracture there, but actually you're just looking at skin folds. So you can see a skin fold here. Can you see that? So I'm gonna draw lines, a skin fold there. And you can also see like a bit of a skin fold here. And that's actually the nail that is sitting over there. So if it continues beyond the bone, then you're not looking at a fracture whatsoever, right? 
but you still you've got to keep drawing around drawing around let's get that pen out and then draw draw again so pen draw like this draw like this keep drawing just make sure that everything looks okay and actually everything looks okay so far and the next bit i really want to make sure i look at is going to be that metatarsal head all right over here okay and that's a really really common place to get um sort of stress fractures or what is known as a freiburg's or freiburg's or freiburg's infraction and the next place that you can get a um a stress fracture is going to be in the region of the metatarsal shaft over here so we need the second or the third and you'll just see a bit of haziness sitting around these regions but in this situation we don't have that at all so we've got to really keep looking around no one's seen anything just yet it's fair enough then um, the next thing I do is make sure that this is nicely aligned. So I draw like this, like this, and it all kind of aligns nicely. So I'm not looking at a Liz Frank injury where everything would have shifted right across in that particular situation. That's not what's happening here at all. So let's um, get rid of that pole. I don't know how that pole's turned up. Okay, so then we'll just keep going, just to keep having a look. So keep going around, keep going around, keep drawing, keep drawing, keep drawing, keep drawing. And then actually someone's seen it. So let's have a look. If we draw around this shaft over here, like so, that all looks okay. When you come to this area here, can you see that it's doing this, 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 and there's like a bit of a discrepancy just over here like that, and they're going on like this. So if we get rid of that and then just zoom in a bit, we should be able to see that a bit more clearly. Can you see that? Okay, and pan across, there you go. There you go, you can see that kind of discrepancy there. And then the kind of like flake like this coming up like this. So that's definitely a fracture, exactly like someone said. It's a fracture of the proximal, um, the proximal phalanx, just right near the neck. So um, it can be quite difficult to see. And the thing, the reason why I do bring it up is because look, this is definitely not a skin fold because you see the skin fold like this, and this is nowhere near that skin fold. It's completely different. And that jagged little corner over there makes you think, yeah, this is definitely not a skin fold. This is 100% a fracture. Okay, so let's open the next case. What do you make out of the hyperlucency? Okay, let's go back. I just want to go back. Someone asked a question. What do you make out of the hyperlucency at the metatarsal head? Let's zoom in and have a look. So metatarsal head, and I think that's to the first one, which is this one here. So what I think is going on in this situation is that you've got your hallux sesamoid bones are here, and you do have a little bit of a, a little bed for them to sit in, right? And so when you sometimes get an angle, you kind of see that little bed over there and you think, okay, that could be something up. But actually it's just where that metatarsal, where that medial hallux sesamoid bone is. And I think what you see on a CT scan is a little dip there. You might see a little dip in that metatarsal head sitting for the metatar uh, for the sesamoid bones bilaterally. So yeah, exactly right. Someone's answered as um, sesamoid bones. Okay, so let's open this one. Hopefully this is a bit more straightforward. Uh, this is someone who's had a knee replacement. And they've come in with sudden onset knee pain. Okay, so let's uh, zoom in and have a look and see what's going on. So let's zoom and let's pan this across. So yeah, let's have a look at the replacement. So one of the things you want to do is make sure there's no radial lucency around the actual um, knee replacement. So you draw like so, draw like, and actually that will look like, uh, okay, doesn't it? There's no real radial lucency here whatsoever. Everything looks okay. Nothing looks malaligned. You've got a little bit of this sort of osteophytosis or heterotropic ossification that can happen post um, post these uh, these replacements and stuff. But actually, the actual replacement looks okay. So I wouldn't say there's any loosening uh, whatsoever. But there is this odd sort of flake of bone. Can everyone see that just sitting right over here? Okay, so that doesn't look quite right. And when you kind of draw it, it looks a bit like this, like a bit of a, like an edge of a shell, like someone's got a, a, a shell, an egg and just smashed it. And it's a little flake of bone sitting over there. And this is why it's so important to have both views. So if we have a look at this view and then zoom in, we can see that actually that piece of bone is sitting over here, right? And actually when you kind of, if we pan this across and have a closer look and have a look at that piece of bone, so it could be, you could say, look, well, you know, what? I think that is just um, a calcified loose body. And actually, yeah, you can get calcified loose bodies a lot of the time in the soft tissue within the superior joint effusion. But in this particular situation, it can't be because actually you can see the actual, um, uh, the quadra, the, the, the ligament, the quadriceps, um, quadriceps tendon actually going all the way down and attaching here. So therefore this must be an avulsion injury. Essentially what's happened is that you've ended up having Let's get this back into a single screen. Around this area, you've had an evolution of that bone has gone all the way backwards. And now everything's all bunched up that way. And the same as anywhere else in the body, if you get an evolution injury, the muscle, the muscles kind of resting state 
is that it's contracted. So when you get a biceps tendon injury, the muscle kind of retracts all the way upwards into the upper arm, same as a quadriceps tendon tear. The, the muscle, the quadriceps kind of pulls it backwards and you end up with a tendon sitting halfway up the leg. And in this particular situation, you've actually got some of the, um, some of the, the patella tendon sitting all the way up the leg as well. Okay, so um, let's have a, so no questions about that one. Let's open the next case. Ooh, okay, so it's going to be a bit of a challenge, I think. So let's have a look. So they look like a younger person. Okay, so that's one thing. And we just zoom, we have a pan round, pan round again, and just have a look and see if we can find anything going on. So just really, you know, genuinely draw around, especially in the beginning when you're first learning, really learn to draw around, have a look at that metatarsal head, have a look at the shafts of the metatarsals as well. Make sure that, you know, you don't have any, um, any, uh, we call it stress fractures or any sort of Freebergs infraction or anything like that. But actually everything looks relatively okay on this particular view. So what we'll do, we'll grab the next view and actually hopefully, hopefully we've actually got a bit of a star sitting here. So someone spotted something, uh, if not us just yet. So someone else has spotted something. I can see they've written it in there. Well done. So then what we'll do, we'll just have a look around, uh, just pan that across over to this way. So everything looks like they're aligned. So have a look here and we can see that actually this is nicely aligned there. So we're not looking at any sort of um, uh, Liz Frank injury, no metatarsal shaft fracture at all. And coming up to here, we really got to start drawing around everything. So draw around like here, draw around that proximal phalanx, that phalanx there. Uh, that looks okay. That looks okay. These are growth plates, by the way. So just make sure that you know that. Um, very, very important because you, you know, don't get confused because actually when you zoom into these areas, if you zoom in, they look very, very sclerotic as you come up to the edges, but the um, fractures don't look very sclerotic. And I'm going to show you exactly why. So if we do this, so if you look at this particular um, this particular growth plate, you can see yep, there's nice sclerosis or it, it becomes more white as you get to the edges. But this particular area over here doesn't have that sort of increased whiteness that occurs. It's very, very linear, very, very sort of black on this image. And actually also, as you look closer and closer, you can see there is a bit of a, a fracture line like this and a kind of an oblique fracture going like that. So it's like an, a, a spiral fracture of the shaft of that second. Is that second? Let's zoom out. Didn't actually count. Now it's going to be third. So yeah, it's because the big toe is going to be there. So it's going to be one, two, three. So it's going to be the a kind of a spiral fracture of the body of the third proximal phalanx on this one. Uh, someone has got it. So good. Well done. Well done. Okay. So let's go to the next case and try and move that out of the way. Don't know why that's popped up there. And that was, so let's go to case number five. This is slightly more challenging. Took me a bit of time to figure this one out. So um please feel free to give it a shot. This is going to be a bit of a challenge, I think. So um, again, you know, just stick to the rules, stick to the rules. Always sort of um, have a look, you know, zoom in, zoom in, and just have, pan around, pan around, and just make sure you've had a good look around and make sure you've kind of drawn around every single, every single bone, right? Uh, going through, going through, and then, you know, again, look for that second metatarsal head, make sure there's no increased sclerosis there, because otherwise you're looking at a Freeberg's infraction. And then you want to look at the shafts as well, make sure there's no evidence of any stress fracture whatsoever. And actually everything looks pretty good. And sometimes you want to zoom in and make sure you have a good look at that terminal tuft. The terminal tufts are going to be uh, these areas over here. And just make sure there's no fractures at all anywhere at all, uh, anywhere there either. So that's good. And let's scroll, scroll through, scroll through. So everything looks okay so far. Let's uh, zoom in and have a look at this region. So. Sometimes you're, uh, the patient is quite unlucky and we've ended up getting a fracture of the distal fibula and we can catch that sometimes on these things. So let's see, and we can kind of draw that around like that. Difficult to see beyond that. You may think, oh, is there a fracture there? But actually that continues that way to be that sort of tibial plafond and that's the sort of Taylor, Taylor dome over there. So we're not looking at a fracture there at all. And we've got to go across and actually what we're seeing here, and well done, someone has seen something up. So this is really subtle, uh, and um, they had, did have a subsequent CT to show that to show that this was. And I completely understand if people would say no, I don't, I don't buy it, and uh, fair enough. But um, what I'll show you is that actually in this situation, first of all, you've got a lot of soft tissue swelling here. Can you see how swollen it is in general, anyway? But sometimes when you get lots of soft tissue swelling area it's very important to have a look in that area and just make sure there's nothing going on so the navicular actually looks okay uh you've got your cuboid that looks okay but this area over here looks slightly more sclerotic that way 
And this doesn't look quite right there as well. And actually, can you see here, let's zoom in, around here, and this is this is subtle as it gets, okay? Um, and I completely understand that someone may say, no, I'm not gonna buy that, but it looks a little bit discrepancy over here as well. So that it looks like there's a very subtle calcaneal fracture sitting there. And um, turned out it was right. Yeah, there was a, a quite significant calcaneal fracture that extended through to the articular surfaces, a bit of a fracture there. And actually, interestingly, there was a fracture of the, tib the uh, tibial plafond, which we can't entirely appreciate on the, um, the X-ray. So that's uh, hopefully interesting. And some people, yeah, someone came out with calcaneum. Well done. Yeah, you're a, you sound like a superstar. Okay, so let's have a look at this case. Um, and I've talked about this when people try and punch things. Um, it seems as though they don't really punch things properly. And I've said before, I'm not endorsing people punching anyone or anything like that. But if you were in in inclined to punch someone, you really want to be using like the first two knuckles, keep your wrist very, very straight. So all the forces go through to your, to like the larger bows, the radius, right? And the force kind of st goes straight along the hand like this. If you do it at any sort of angle whatsoever, then you end up getting forces that go at kind of just all the wrong ways. I mean, I don't think we're really designed to punch things, right? But the the point is like, if you're gonna, if you were that way inclined, and that's why people are trained to do this kind of stuff, um, you end up getting these dodgy looking fractures because the force of weight will end up going down this way, but your hand is kind of made to go that way. And you're getting, again, you got fractures there, fractures there. So when you look at this person, it seems like they're no stranger to getting into a bit of a scuffle, right? Because when you look at the fifths here, right, you can see that, yeah, this doesn't look right, does it? Because actually, this is all kind of angled this way. That's angled this way as well, isn't it? It just doesn't look well, it doesn't look right. And then again, on the other side as well, yeah, very, very angulated. Can you see it kind of, kind of does, um, it does this thing like this way, going like this. And there's a bit of like extra bone formation there. It kind of curled them like, like a walking stick, essentially. So this person is no stranger to getting uh, into, I mean, I, I mean, I, I would say, are they professional? Well, I'd be surprised for a professional to get this kind of, this kind of, these kind of fractures, right? And then actually you can see that, I mean, I'm, I'm inferring from uh, previous imaging that this person is probably getting into a bit of a fight. And um, so they've got that one previously, but now they've got this sort of impact of fracture over there. But on top of that, when you actually zoom into this, you can see that this impacted fracture also 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 um, involves the articular surface of that metatarsal head. Can you see that there it kind of goes this way as well? So there is a bit of discrepancy, a bit of impaction. These two areas are kind of really compacting into one another. And you've got this, what looks like a fracture going right across there. So they're probably going to, you know what, if this person continues um, with the punching form they've got, they're probably going to end up with like wonky metacar metacarpals all the way along because, yeah, I don't know. And look, this is really short as well. This is very short. They just don't really have the hands for, for fighting anymore. So um, I thought it was quite an interesting case just because usually you'll have one and then, you know, that's it. But this time you've got old, old and new just sitting right there. So a fairly interesting case. And uh, were there acute symptoms while the x-rays both hands? Yeah, so uh, I think what's happened here is that this person may have gone to an altercation was saying both hands were hurting. And that's why they ended up getting both hands x-rays. And they're clearly no stranger to having, um, you know, getting into scuffles and stuff. And so um, that's why this person had quite a low threshold for getting x-rays in the first place. And yeah, and that we picked up one fracture on this occasion. But for all we know, this person may have had fractures. On, these could have happened at the same time. They may have had, may have had others like we can't see right now because they've healed. But uh, that's why they end up having fracture of both because they've had a fight and said both hands are hurting. Okay, so this one's got a pole. Um, so it's Saadu, um, my, uh, my friend who's helping me, my cousin. He is going to put up that pole while I have a look at this. and I'll explain what's going on. So... This looks like an abdominal film, and we don't have um, we don't have all the the abdomen in here, unfortunately. But I think it kind of gives you what you really want to know. So let's see what people are saying. Okay, so what we're looking at here are bowel, right? So we've got multiple loops of bowel sitting in this region, and this is all kind of in the lower abdomen around here. So usually you'd say, okay, if it's centrally placed, then it's small bowel. If it's peripherally placed then we're going to say that this is going to be large bowel, right? Because large bowels sit on the outside and small bowels sit on the inside. But here, because you've got so little in the abdomen, it's difficult to be 100% as to, you know, is this outside or is this uh, kind of central or is it outside? Where are they? Oh, no, I've already done that question. So, and when you look at this particular bowel, actually, you can see that there's these linear lines going all the way across. I don't know why I dragged that, but you can see loads and loads of lines going all the way across, right? 
what are people saying? Exactly right. So there are two types of lines you get with bowel. You either get lines that go halfway across or not all the way across like so, and those are called haustra. And then you've got valvular conventes. And so they're like valves, I guess. I mean, maybe that's why they're called valvular conventes. And they really push the, the, um, the, uh, the food along, right? And, they, and they're slightly more muscular in appearance and they've kind of got linear thing all the way across. And so when it's valvular conventes, that means that it is small bowel that is dilated, not large bowel. And therefore the large bowel must be on the outside. And we don't really have, we can't really see much there. And so therefore, you know, you think, okay, so it must be like quite proximal bowel obstruction. Maybe you could say that there is a bit of large bowel sitting within this region that's slightly dilated, possibly. So maybe the bowel obstruction could be re in the region of the ascending the colon. But those are the kind of things that you can infer. But the main thing you know, 100%, if you've got someone who's sick, who's coming like this, who's got valvular conventes, dilated small bowel within the abdomen like this, it's going to be a small bowel obstruction. And hopefully, if I've got this correct, we should have the follow-up CT scan of this patient. If not, I'll tell you when that follow-up CT scan is. Now, one of the things I like, and I will be showing this as we go through, like the reason why I use Collector Minds and so does my um, lecturing um, business, is that, you know, you, there are so many people on here today and it downloads so, so quickly. And as you can see, it's very, very smooth for everyone involved. And we can all kind of scroll through and learn together and work through the problems together. And so uh, what you do is that little cloud button will appear and you download it and then there you go, you're off. And as you can see, I'm using the pen functions which are built into the system for me to be able to teach. So I'm gonna do one scroll through because not everyone is able to access the cases or maybe people be watching this on YouTube later on. So I'm gonna do one scroll through all the way down, all the way down like so, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And just wanna try and see if you can find any abnormalities. So I don't think this is the follow-up. This is not the follow-up of that previous one, okay? So that's this is not the follow-up. So we're gonna just have to start from refresh essentially. So first off, uh, okay, so let's share these results. So most people got con valvular condiventes with that last one. Okay, good. I would fail to share poll for some reason. I'll leave that with Seidel. Okay, so first up, what you want to do is try and see whether this is a contrast enhanced study or not. So the way I do it is just have a look at the aorta and see if there's how bright it is, especially compared to the bone. Now, if it's not as bright as the bone, then you're probably looking at a non-contrast study. Now, then the next slice I'd go to is this slice over here. We're looking at the aorta and you're also looking at the portal vein and see what they look like in comparison to one another. If the portal vein is brighter than the aorta or about the same, then I would say it's a portal venous phase. And if the aorta is just as bright as the bone on this particular window, then I'd go, probably go for an arterial or aortic phase image. So someone has come out with, yeah, you're right, but that's not why the person's come in. So there's abdominal pain, non-contrast study. Someone for some reason has thought that this person has got bowel, uh, renal colic. So let's have a look at these kidneys. So kidney is there and there. And let's have a look and scroll through. So come down. And so we're going to look for the ureter. Ureter is that little dot there. So let's concentrate on that ureter. Let's zoom in a bit. Oops. Let's do that and zoom. And then we're going to keep our eyes on this particular area over here. Can everyone see that? So right there. And we're going to go all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And you kind of feel like you lose it, but actually it's just here and it goes through and it's completely fine. And then you come to the other side. And let's start from the very, very top again. So ureter is where? Here. So that's a ureter there. Go down, go down, go down. Follow it, follow it, follow it. Can be difficult. Don't worry, my pen is still on it. Still following. Can you see it's going down this way? Into there. And there's no calculus whatsoever. So this is not a renal colic. This is not a renal colic picture. Someone has says, yeah, so someone is right. There are gallstones here. So I'm going to zoom in there as well and have a look. So gallstones, you're right, but that doesn't always cause pain, right? Some people are walking around with gallstones and no issues whatsoever. So gallstones can look like this, okay? They don't have to be bright and white because, you know, they sometimes they've got um, a lot of fat within them and fat looks very, very sort of light or they can be intermediate. And you can actually see on this particular one, you've got a bit of peripheral calcification, but sort of a low signal uh, or low density centers to them. So yeah, there are gallstones, but actually... The gallbladder itself, when you zoom in, you can't see much in the way of fat strand and the fat actually looks completely fine. Now, someone has said it correctly. So now you've got to think about, okay, so we haven't seen kidney stone. We do have gallstones, but no inflammation. The pancreas can cause pain. So let's have a look at the pancreas. The pancreas is sitting around this region over here. And actually that looks okay. The fat around there doesn't look completely abnormal at all. Let's zoom in a bit and pan this across to the middle there. And yet someone has found it. So well done. So what we'll do, is we'll go, what I, so yeah, someone also said that there is a um, central umbilical hernia. So let's have a look. And yeah, you are right. There is an umbilical hernia 
that is sitting right over here. So you are correct. But that I don't think is really causing much in the way of any problems. There's no evidence of any herniation of any bowel through there. Maybe a little bit of inflammation, but nothing that I'd be particularly worried about. So now we've got to do the long haul and really follow the bowel. So look, if we, uh, let's get my pen function out. We're going to follow here, okay, and just follow, and watch my mouse or the pen and just follow it around, follow it around, going this way, going this way. So look, we're going, for those that don't know, we're going this way, this way, this way, this way. You can see that like this, all the way like this. And yeah, you do have a few diverticula, but none of them look particularly inflamed. So we're not thinking this is a diverticulitis so far. The pen is still here. We're going across. We're going across like this region over here. No diverticula on this particular area coming across. And actually, when you stop here, can everyone, someone's seen it, but I'm going to show you. So if you look at that fat that's over here and then look at the fat that's over here, can you see? There's a bit of a difference in the appearance of that fat. So what I'll do, I'll zoom in just to show everyone again. I zoom in. Look at that fat that is sitting over here. So there, that's the fat that's sitting over here. And the look of the fat that's sitting over here. So that looks very, very hazy. And so it's a bit of an unusual place, but actually there's a slightly kind of brighter dot there. And you can almost feel like it looks a bit spherical around that area and then disappears, right? So that little dot there is like a thrombose vessel of, of basically an epiploic uh, appendage. And so this is called epiploic appendagitis on the anti enteric side. You've got hyperdense center. You've got some low signal around it and then a peripheral hyperdensity as well. These are all telltale signs of epiploic appendagitis. Now, usually you'd get epiploic appendagitis located within the region of the sigmoid colon. But in this particular situation, there's a slightly unusual presentation of a very common case, which for those of you that are sitting 2Bs or the FRCR exams or any sort of exams, they love cases where um, they give you like very common uh, diagnoses, but in uncommon places. And I've got a few of these epiploic appendagitis, which are just not where you'd expect to be. But by definition, they can't really be anything else. And the other signs sort of contribute to the idea that this must be epiploic appendagitis. So well done. Someone did pick that up um, very, very quickly indeed as well. OK, so let's go to we're doing pretty well. So I think we might be able to get through some of the contributed cases. Would it need a contrast enhanced study? No, it wouldn't. I don't think so. So the thing is, epiploic appendagitis, you don't really want to be doing surgery. And this is sort of so, like, there's no perforation, there's no collection, there's no, there's not even a diverticular within the region for there to be diverticulitis. And it's so sort of, um, it's so clear that this is epiploic appendagitis that doing contrast and study is not going to help. Um, you only really need to do contrast and studies if you're worried about bowel ischemia, which we didn't see any secondary signs of because the bowel actually looked normal around it. It didn't look particularly inflamed or dilated. Look for tumours, collections, bleeding, all that kind of thing. But in the situation, fair enough, we went for a non-contrast study, which is not ideal for abdominal pain, but we've got a diagnosis that doesn't necessarily need a contrast and study. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. And this is the follow-up for that previous X-ray of the small bowel obstruction. So now when you go to this one, you can hopefully see that the liver is there and you can see that there is some radiolucency or some kind of low density on kind of both sides of the of the portal vein. So this must be periportal edema rather than biliary tract obstruction. The gallbladder actually looks OK. It doesn't look too bad. And actually, you can see there's a fair bit of fluid within the abdomen here. There's a few renal cysts uh, sitting over um, sitting over here as well. And coming further down, there's more, more fluid. And then you can also see those areas that we saw earlier with the sort of dilated small bowel that is located around here as well. So someone's saying signs of gas and liquid, some kind of ileus. Yeah, so exactly. So there is, so a lot of this is fluid filled. So that's why we didn't see some of the dilated bowel. You can only see dilated bowel if there's going to be air filled on an X-ray. So actually, when I do my reporting, I always say no evidence of air filled bowel obstruction because there have been occasions where the bowel is so full of fluid that you just can't see it and the x-ray actually looks pretty normal or you just can't see the problem. But here you can see that, yeah, look, there are multiple loops of dilated small bowel and some of it's less dilated, but just doesn't look quite, doesn't look very, very happy at all. But you can't see 100% like where is this problem? Like what, what's causing it? So what I do is I always look at the hernial orifices, make sure that those look completely normal. So there's no evidence of any obstruction there. Then I do another cursory scroll through, try and see if there's any whirling of any bowel anywhere like that, just to make sure that there's no herniation or something that could be causing this problem. I haven't seen anything like that. So then you really got to go for the long haul and sort of just follow the bowel. So again, what we'll do, we're going to zoom in, go right to the end here. And then hopefully you guys can see where I am. Where I'm just over here, right here. 
Okay, then we just follow it up. Okay, so follow, 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 follow me, follow my pen, we're going this way, going round. So my constants always, whenever going through a uh, bowel, is if I do find myself lost, I always know that the right, the descending colon and the ascending colon are generally always placed on those sides of the body. So look, if I was going along and I kind of lost it and thought, oh, okay, I've gone that way, what I'll do is go to that side. Okay, that must be the descending colon. Look, now you can see that connecting up this way. And you can see like where it's going, you can follow the all the way around, but the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, um, uh, all look okay so far. Coming across this way, it looks like we've got transverse colon squeezing behind that dilated bowel, going right across, looks very, very collapsed, doesn't it? And you're coming up to what, this way, I think, coming upwards, all difficult to find. Okay, let's go for the, look, one of my constants is gonna be the ascending colon, where does that go? Hepatic flexure, I feel like it's going this way. Uh, going yeah there we go so it's going like this can you see that like that and then go all the way down again just follow so we go follow down follow down follow down we should be coming up to the sequel pole soon enough and actually when you get to this area here it starts to look a bit coalesced and a little bit inflamed and actually if we go if we press i think it's one two which was lung windows lung windows this locular of air does not look like it really belongs anywhere so if we go back to this get rid of that pen marking you can see that there's this locular air that kind of seeps out this way like that and comes outwards that way. And it seems to connect to what looks like a blind ending loop like this, somewhere like that, right? So therefore this must be a perforated inflamed. So it's not just inflamed, it's a perforated appendix because there's a few locules of air there. And, that, and actually there could be a collection. Can you see that? Look, this is like this. And there's like an air, air fluid level just sitting within there. So I'm gonna draw that there like this. So therefore, this is a perforated appendicitis, right? And that generalized irritation, inflammation has resulted in a secondary ileus or ileus uh, with regards to the um, with regards to the small bowel. So I thought that was quite an interesting case. And so, yeah, you picked up most of it really, which is very, very good uh, actually. So um, let's go. So I think we can probably start going for it. So let's try and get through as many of these donated cases uh, as we, as Sado said, genuinely, genuinely, first of all, I appreciate anyone that gives me their time. You know, half time is hard to get anyone to give you your time, their time. So I really appreciate that. And I genuinely, genuinely appreciate people, um, you know, putting in their cases, getting us to look at it and hopefully we'll learn from. Um, we were thinking of, at some point, it might be nice to get some of you guys to take the stage. And, um, you know, if you want to present your own case, then that'd be really, really great. And we could talk through it and, you know, discuss things and have a bit more of a discussion. So if this is your case and you do want to um, uh, discuss it or go through it, then please feel free to let us know. If not, I'm just going to go through it and Sada will be able to sort of keep up with the, the messages that are coming through. So first off, we're going to have a look at this. And it looks like at the moment, this is a non-contrast study uh, CT scan. And OK, look, so this is a good example. So if we go to and pull this across. So can you see my rule? Yeah. So um, if we uh, how do we know where there's contrast? Have a look at that. The aorta doesn't look like it's got any um, any brightness there. This looks bright, doesn't it? So therefore, th this one over here is going to be a contrast in our study. So now let's look for the portal vein. Portal vein is there and actually looks about equal to each other. So it doesn't look particularly bright. It doesn't look as bright as the bone. So therefore, this is a portal venous phase image. So this is a non-contrast study, first off. Uh, let's just concentrate on this particular sli si slice. And we just scroll through and hopefully you can see straight away that this is very, very regular. Can you see that? So regular contour to the liver probably means cirrhosis. So straight away, people are given the answer, which is great. And those are the things that we would be thinking of, right? You've also got lots of ascites or free fluid within the abdomen. It doesn't look particularly bright. Um, and for those that don't know what you do, if you are worried that this could be blood, you get a house unit measurement and you measure there. And then you look for somewhere that you know to have fluid, like the gallbladder or the urinary bladder. And then you compare the two numbers. And if they're about the same, then you're probably looking at fluid. That's just a really quick way. If you don't remember the numbers, it's fine. You can do it that way. But you, everything else actually looks okay. That pancreas doesn't look particularly inflamed. Uh, so we're not looking at any sort of pancreatitis. The spleen is surprisingly not that enlarged, uh, considering how much cirrhosis they've got going on here. And, and a quick cursory look through the bowel doesn't show any gross abnormalities, right? So now let's have a look at the portal venous system. And here, you know, what's what kind of concerning is that you've got this sort of ill-defined radiolucency or kind of slightly sort of lower density circumferential area located within the dome of the bowel, uh, the dome of the liver. You've got these kind of areas, can you see that? But they're all linear, 
right? Can you see all these linear areas, right? So you're not looking at lesions. These are continuous lesions. These are sort of linear, continued, low density lesions going through. And actually, when you follow that round, it feels like it continues into this, yeah? And then as you follow that, that continues into the portal vein like so. So you've got what looks like a filling defect. And look, this filling defect goes all the way to the left lobe of the liver as well and stops there. How far does it go? And all the way down. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, look, it feels like it goes just across that way to begin to go towards the, um, the splenic artery, but you can't, and splenic vein. So this is probably one of the biggest portal vein thrombosis I've ever seen, basically, because it look, the entire right lobe of the liver, all the portal veins are pretty much blocked up. You've got this low density lesion here, which is concerning for an underlying malignancy. You've got a background of cirrhosis, a big portal vein um, from both sitting in. Can you see there's increased vasculature all within this region over there? And that is the beginnings of a sort of cavernous transformation of this because not enough blood is getting through. A whole load of collaterals are being made to try and supply that liver. You've also got a whole load of collaterals sitting around that sort of gallbladder area because that looks like it's bright, but all very, very linear. So there's all part of that whole collateral flow. And generally speaking, the bowel just doesn't look very, um, it looks all bathed within this sort of low density um, I mean, bathe within the uh, a site as well. Just want to have a quick look at the bones just to make sure I haven't missed anything there. But this is a really, really great example of a portal vein thrombosis on a background of severe uh, liver cirrhosis, actually. So I really appreciate um, someone donating that for all of us to see. Okay, hang on. So it um, looks like my battery is running out. So I'm just going to do plug that in. Okay, good. So hopefully that won't run out on us. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much for that one. Uh, let's go to this one. So this is, it looks like a very young patient. So again, this is, I mean, what I love about Collective Minds is that you can be so quick with downloading the cases and going through. And you can see these sort of red lines, right? They just, that means the case is ready for you to look at. So we're just waiting for this one to go through. And, but the rest of them look like they're already through. And so this is the lung windows of this patient. And straight away, you can see that this area over here doesn't look quite right, does it? It looks very, very abnormal coming down into this sort of lower um, chest area here. So let's go look and look at the, what well, looks like a non-contrast study, actually, of a very, very young patient. Do we have any contrast in our study? It doesn't look like we do. Oh, no, we do. The chest under pelvis there. Yeah, is that kind of contrast? I might have to wait for that to come through. It says uh, phase, doesn't it? Phase one, phase two, let's have a look. Um, no, that's just a single image. Okay, oops, let's look at that one. No, it doesn't look like it, but on this bone window, you can see that this is very much a young patient. You can see all the growth plates are sitting here as well. And you've got the abdomen and pelvis uh, on this image as well. So clearly, you know, this patient's not very well and we've shoved them through the scanner to try and find out what's going on. But the main thing that we can see here is that there is what looks like um, quite an extensive uh, fluid amount of fluid located within the um, the right uh, lung cavity. And also there's like a, a fluid 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 level um, sitting over here as well. So someone's saying a pleural edema, you have to say pleural effusions. You don't, I mean, you can't really say edema because edema would be just like a subtle thing and you wouldn't really see it so much. But this looks like a pleural effusion, but what's concerning is that this fluid fluid level sitting over here, I mean, this fluid air level sitting like this does start to get you to worry there could actually be an underlying empyema. And empyema is basically like a loculated collection located within the uh, pleural fluid. But then actually, interestingly, they've also got a chest drain that is sitting over here. So a lot of the air that's sitting within the pleural cavity may be secondary to that chest drain in the first place. So it's hard to know what came first. Was, just, was there just fluid and then we put a chest drain in and then you get this sort of air cavity, meaning it looks like some sort of empyema or was that air cavity already there? But regardless, there is sort of a kind of slightly loculated appearance to the fluid within the area, which would therefore get you concerned in a young patient who's very, very sick, that there is an underlying empyema and they, you know, they've clearly done the right thing here by sticking a drain and hopefully start to drain that and treat them with, with antibiotics. Right, so we're coming up to, uh, there was some really good cases coming up. Uh, okay, I think, I really think we can get through these. So let's, um, any questions? Okay, no questions at the moment. Fine, let's do a, another download. And this one is a really interesting case because first off, remember I'm teaching you about, so we've had a bit of a theme today about contrast, okay? Uh, is this a contrast or non-contrast study, right? So um, feel free to tell me what you think. So we're scrolling through, uh, just wait for that to come through. So I think, yeah, this is gonna be a non-contrast study. Um, and you can see that because the aorta doesn't look particularly bright and none of the vessels look particularly bright either. So we're scrolling through. And we just do one scroll through to begin with. 
Okay, so this person is no stranger to surgery or the surgeons, as it were. And has anyone seen anything? Not yet. Okay, let's have a look. Let's have a look. So hematuria, I think, was the issue. So the liver actually looks okay. Gallbladder looks okay. The gallbladder is in this region over here. And then um, looking at the kidneys, right? So let's have a look at the kidneys. So that's the right kidney there. Scrolling through. It doesn't look particularly dilated. That ureter goes all the way down. Let's zoom in. Let's zoom in. That, I think that's going to be ureter. Let's follow up because I don't want to get that wrong. So look, ureter is just there. And then let's zoom, go down, go down, go down. Follow that. So my mouse is still on it. Kind of slightly lost it, but I think I'm still here going through. Can you see that's gone straight into there? So that's one ureter. And on the other side, oh, looks like we've got a stent, right? So we've got a stent in that kidney. Okay, so look, we've got a stent that's coming up here. So that must go into the ureter. Yeah, it does. We'll follow that all the way up all the way up, all the way up. So it looks slightly dilated. So someone said, yeah, hydroureter, probably. Yeah, a little bit. Coming up, coming up, and that ureter extent is there. But that doesn't look quite right. So first off, yeah, you're right. We do have um, some hydronephrosis. Looks like a sort of Mickey Mouse hand, yeah? But then on top of that, this looks very, very dense. But remember, this is a non-contrast study. So why would you have hyper-dense like material located within the within the ureters, right? So you can't get hyperdense material located in the ureters if you do a contrast enhanced study. You give the contrast, you wait long enough for the kidneys to filter that, that contrast through, and then it collects within the collecting system, and then it goes down into the urinary bladder. So you'll have get scans where either you've timed it really well and you managed to get the contrast sitting within the collecting system, the ureters, all the way through into the urinary bladder, or you're gonna have it just sitting with the urinary bladder because it's very, very delayed and the kidneys have already got, got it all done. But remember, this left side looks completely, I mean, this right side looks completely fine, but this looks very hyperdense. And in the context of a non-contrast study, this is probably clotted blood, right? So coagulated clotted blood looks very, very dense on a non-contrast study. And that's what's been happening. It looks like they've had a bleed. So a number of things can cause bleeds in the kidneys, obviously trauma. So unfortunately, when people are boxing and you know they punch someone really hard in the kidneys, a kidney blow can result in a bleed and you get different grades of bleeds and lacerations and all that kind of thing. Um, tumors can cause it and uh, you know, itrogenic. So after someone has actually done something. And so you do wonder whether maybe putting that stent in hasn't done, you know, has unfortunately resulted in a small bleed and resulted in that. And the thing is, once it becomes all clotted up and hardened up, it's going to be very, very thick. And so therefore, uh, it's going to end up acting like an obstruction, essentially. So that is a blood clot or lots of blood clots sitting located within the left renal um, uh, renal collecting system. Right. So let's have a look at. Oh yeah, when you get the call at three a.m. Yeah, I know that feeling. I don't know how many of you guys have been in the situation. You just you're tired, um, and yeah, you get a phone call, and then like a scan comes in, and you're thinking, oh great, here we go. So um, just wait for this to download. So, you know, some of these images are quite large, actually, 595 images. And some of them, you know, when you get these vascular studies, they do end up being quite big, big files. Uh, but anyway, we'll, this is um, kind of downloading as we speak, and then we'll be able to have a look at it. Now, this, this must have come from a neurocenter because they have got some really cool images. Can you see all these rainbow colored things sitting all over here? This is super, super cool. There's like stroke perfusion uh, studies, right? And so um, what you're essentially doing is trying to see uh, the quality of blood flow that is getting into a particular area. Because when you get an infarction, i.e. a blood clot that's happened, you get some brain that unfortunately is just gone. Like it's just not going to come back. But you get these other areas, I, I think it's known as penumbras, where there's enough blow, uh, blood flow for it to be salvaged. And you can identify those areas by doing these really, really cool studies. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. I think someone who's far more expert uh, at this than me has given us this case. So, um, yeah, like I said, I really, really do appreciate that coming through. So um, let's have a look and see what's going on here. So this looks like a vascular study. And we are looking at a CT angiogram of the um, CT angiogram of the carotid vessels. And when you come up to, let's say, this level here, this is where the internal carotid arteries would be. And if we go to a different window, can you see uh, over here, that's the petrous portion of the carotid artery on the left, but can you see it just, you can't really see it there at all. So there, this looks kind of blocked up and you come up to here, then you have a bit of reconstitution of the vessel or the circle of Willis because you've got collateral flow from the rest of the rest of the vessels. But definitely it looks like when you come further down to the petrous area, there's just no blood flow sitting within that 
uh, within the internal carotid artery. And then look, that's internal carotid artery on the left, but there's just not one on the, the right at all. And that goes all the way down to quite far down here um, through to the bifurcation. So it's not long after the bifurcation, you end up getting this loss of blood flow. Uh, actually, I don't think, I think you don't get any blood flow at any point on this internal carotid. So we can actually follow that down maybe. So that's carotid, and then it disappears around here. So there looks like there's some blockage essentially. Uh, so now what we'll do is just have a look and see whether we can find any secondary changes of ischemia. Uh, so when you look at this area, it can be a bit difficult to really 100% say, but I do think there is a bit of radiolucency sitting here compared to here. There's a loss of gray white matter. So when you have these ischemic events, it's going to be difficult to be 100% on this because it's not a non-contrast study. Do we have a non-contrast study at all? No. But what you're looking for essentially is like what the differentiation between the gray and the white matter is. And around here, it just looks a little bit um, asymmetrical. But what I thought was really cool, or I mean, it's not cool for the patient by any means, but you can see on the perfusion studies, there is a complete difference here. Can you see that? Like there's not much in the way of blood flow. Now, um, this whole, like I had to look, I had to kind of look into it again and I've completely forgotten what is like how this all goes, but there's actually a measurement to try and figure out like how good the blood flow is to a particular place. And um, the long and short of it is, that if you've got like a bit of ischemic, uh, ischemic area of um, brain, then you just don't get very much blood flow. So you get like CBF, which is like very, very low. And then you've got your, um, your blood volume, which is also going to be very, very low. And then you've got something called the mean transit time. And so, they, I mean, this is all going to be generally quite low because um, you're just not getting any blood going through. But when you've got sort of an area of uh, brain that may be able to come back, even though it looks like it's within the area of ischemia, then the, the blood flow is actually maintained or slightly higher because there's been a bit of a, the brain's trying to keep it going by like vasodilating and you know, pushing more blood that way. And you can identify where those penumbras are. And so like, for example, you know, I'm no expert and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but these areas that look very, very low, but then you'd be looking at these sort of areas around it where you'd actually say, okay, there is some areas of brain that can still uh, be viable. So not a neuro, neuroradiologist. But I love I love this though, by the way. I really did appreciate someone sending this my way because actually, believe it or not, I'm a bit of a radiology nerd and I really enjoy um, looking at scans and learning about scans, even if it's not my entire subspecialty. Okay, so I'm going to skip one because we are coming up to uh, time. And this one was donated as well. Uh, there's a whole load of MR, but I think I'm just going to quickly go through the CT scan of what looks like a fairly youngest person. Um, we're just waiting for the images to come through. I think they are coming through slowly. So from the offset, we can see that there is contrast sitting within that uh, within the aorta over here. So I'm just going to draw that there. Uh, and then when you look at this and this, so the portal vein compared to that, they're about the same, aren't they? So we're probably looking at a port of Venus image. And it feels like there's a fair bit of um, their contrast. So what they've done is IV contrast and oral contrast on this patient as well. So as you scroll through, you can see that there's a whole lot of oral contrast within the within the bowel. I haven't seen like any of this oral contrast sitting in the stomach, have we? Yeah, we do. So it depends on when they took the image. Either there's very slow transit of uh, this contrast through into the rest of the bowel, or we've just taken the image at a point when it hasn't quite gone through. Now, the uh, going through this, the thing that I saw was that there's a whole lot of fluid sitting within here. And then when you zoom in, zoom in a bit, because I thought this would be kind of cool. Can you see around this area here, this kind of snake-like structure, like little snake like there, like that, right? So if you follow that, follow that, follow that, where does that go? It stops. You go back and it goes along like this and goes along like so and goes all the way into the sequel pole. So that that's the appendix, right? Uh, it looks a bit large to me. It looks a bit hyper, hyper, um, hyper um, vascular or uh, enhancing a bit too much for me because you can see how hyper enhancing that is. So let's that there, yeah. When you kind of scroll through that, it just feels like it's hyper enhancing too much. I'd be concerned that there could be an, un an underlying appendicitis. Now with the rest of the bowel, I haven't really seen much more more going on. The rest of the bowel actually looks okay, but there's a whole load of fluid within the abdomen as well. So it. It doesn't quite add up because you don't you can get appendicitis with a bit of fluid but not as much fluid as this um and it doesn't look like the appendix is like 
burst and doesn't look like the collection or anything like that. You know, with the last case, you had a perforation, you had a collection, and then you had the eyeless as well, and a whole lot of fluid. But this one, you don't have any of that. So it is slightly unusual in terms of the way it looks. Now, yes, yeah, someone has said, is the urinary bladder wall thickened? Yeah, it, it is thickened. Yeah, 100%, I agree. But they are a fairly young patient, and it's not entirely completely filled. But what can happen as well, right? If you've got general, I mean, this person could have sort of peritonitis or um, uh, peritoneal inflammation as well, which can result in this sort of enhancement pattern. So you, very, very young. I would do a urine dip for sure. Uh, liver has uneven shape. So have a look. I mean, the thing is, look how young they are, right? So if you look down here, can you see their bones are like this and like this? So very unusual to have like a, a sort of underlying cirrhotic appearance to the liver. And I think actually looks very, very sharp. So if you kind of go like this, you look at that contour there. If we went back to the other one, it would look lobulated and round. Whereas this one, I think the CT scan shows a quite nice looking uh, liver. So I don't think I've got the answer to this one. And I think it's a really interesting case. Um, you know, if I was doing this on call, I would probably bank on there being lots of ascites, inflamed appendix. I'd also ask for a urine dip. Fairly non-committal, isn't it? But um, I think that you'd, I, I would probably go down that road. And if everything came back normal, then I would suggest that they would do an acidic tap and find out, you know, what exactly this fluid is, like where did it come from? Right, so I really, really wanted to go through, I said, we've got five minutes and I really wanted to go through this case. So, and I think we're gonna have time because I thought it was super interesting. And again, I really appreciate the donation. Um, I, may, I may end up using this for my own teaching because I enjoy this one. Um, okay, so we're just waiting for the download. So first off, is it contrast or non-contrast? It looks like a contrast in our study because we can see that there is some increased density located within the auto there. And um, now we're going to scroll through. Let's do one scroll through once it's all downloaded. Come on, mate. Any questions? Oh, no. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's my slow connection. Okay, yeah. Oh, my connection is being a bit slow as well. Okay, so what we'll do is it's still coming. I might just reopen this one. Let's see. Open. Download, download. Come on, amylase elevated. Okay, so amylase is elevated in this one. So yeah, so if you're thinking amylase is elevated, then you gotta be thinking along the lines of, okay, is this appendix, uh, is this uh, pancreatitis? Uh, we're talking about, I mean, what else could it be? Otherwise it could be, you can get a raised amylase in a perforated duodenum. So that'd be something to think about. Uh, apparently no fever and epigastric pain. So uh, is this the extra case with the bowel obstruction? No, we already did that one. Uh, the x-ray case were, with the bowel obstruction ended up being appendicitis resulting in the, the ileus. So we've already done that one. So this one I thought was very, very interesting because, okay, we're going to do one scroll through as quick as we can. So I think we've kind of seen most of what we need to see. Um, oh, there was one other case I wanted to see. I don't know why. I might have to. There was one case I wanted to go through. We're going to have to pull that to next week and next time. Um, unfortunately, uh, I thought I put it on there, but I must have forgotten to attach it. So when we go, let's go from, let's do this systematically. We've got time, right? So first off, is this uh, contrast or non-contrast? It is contrast. We can see that there is contrast sitting within the aorta. It looks very, very bright, doesn't it? Look, if you look at the portal vein compared to that, it looks very, very bright. So it's actually been more of an arterial phase image because it looks almost as bright as the vertebra on this, on this picture. It can happen sometimes that we get that kind of image. Now looking at the gallbladder, we said epigastric pain. Uh, gallbladder looks okay. I can't see any radiopaque calculi. There could be calculi because remember, there can be uh, fat calculi, which we can't see. Let's look for that pancreas because someone said that the amylase is raised, but that pancreas looks okay, doesn't it? Going all, all the way along, all the way along. And she looks completely fine as well. Okay, so uh, pancreas looks okay. Kidneys, they don't look dilated. Um, yeah, good answers coming through already. And um, Kidneys, yeah, kidneys don't look dilated, so we're not worried about an obstruction, and the spleen it doesn't look like has been hit at all. So then um, we're coming up to, let's go for the bowel. Okay, so bowel, um, large bowel, we just follow that up. There's lots of fluid everywhere, so something's up, isn't it? We follow that bowel, follow that bowel, kind of follow this one all the way over here. Let's keep going. So we're up to the splenic flexure over here. And then it kind of starts to look a little bit dilated, maybe transverse colon. Okay, I uh, slightly lost it. Where's it gone? Transverse colon, I think, is going right across the front there. Oops, what happened there? Okay, so my constant is going to be the um, ascending colon, and that looks all right, doesn't it? 
lots of fat strain. And now actually look, can you see all those loops of small bowel and they've got valvular conoventes going right across. So that's so lots of dilated loops of small bowel here. Now I'm trying to figure out what is caused or that dilatation. And the thing that catches my eye is if you look in the upper abdomen, if you look at the, the enhancement of that particular piece of bowel, like if I zoom in now, it looks a bit dusky, like you can't see that bowel wall so well. So if you kind of really um, draw around that bowel wall, it looks a little bit dusky, maybe slightly, slightly hyper enhancing there. But what you do is look, if you look at that bowel wall there and compare it to the bowel wall there, they look very, very different. So it feels like there's not as enough, um, there's not much in the way of, uh, what do you call it, um, contrast getting to, to that, getting through to that. And actually it feels like everything's sort of pinching towards um, this area over here. Can you see this? It feels like everything's pinching that way, right? And then when you look at that, it feels like that particular area of small bowel doesn't look quite right. And there's a whole load of edema located within that mesentery. It's all pinching towards that area over there. So then what I would do is go coronal on this and then scroll through another time and try and see. So we're going from the back all the way to the front. Can you see like this area over here? If you keep your eyes there, it feels like it's all kind of coming through the central area over here. It's almost like a weird, you know how we have coffee bean sign going this way. It feels like a mini coffee bean sitting over there, right? And so, and you can actually scroll through, you can see that's all kind of going that way. Can you see that? In and out. So if I go backwards, it's almost like a swirl of a coffee bean, like you'd otherwise get, but with a sigmoid, uh, with a sigmoid volvulus. This is way too high up, right? So therefore, this is in keeping, oh, sorry, my PT's, um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, okay, so look, so therefore this is a hernia and therefore this is going to be, so there's two types of hernia you can get. You can get a right paraduodenal hernia or a left paraduodenal hernia. And therefore this is on the right side, meaning there's a more, more, most likely to be a right paraduodenal hernia. And that paraduodenal hernia has resulted in ischemia of that bowel. And someone has said, yeah, they said they've actually, this person went to surgery and 20 centimeters of necrotic intestine. So I think, I mean, paraduodenal para hernias aren't very common, but I've heard that, you know, you may, you may have to like confirm this with me, but they are, you know, of the internal hernias that exist, they're going to be the more common one. And that's what we're looking at here. So this is a really fantastic example of a paraduodenal para hernia. And I'm pretty sure that would be hard to find as good a case on the worldwide internet as well. So I really, really appreciate this one. Uh, and um, no doubt some interesting reading that will come behind that. So um, to me, it does look like a right paraduodenal hernia to me. But anyway, um, you know what? What I realized is that there's like, sometimes you, you can give like 90% of the answer that will help the person get through. And so 99% of the answer, 99% of the answer is that there's some sort of ischemic bowel located within the right upper abdomen. And whether you get it right or wrong after that, it doesn't matter because they've gone to surgery and hopefully you've saved their life. So, um, yeah, like I said, you don't always get it right. And you, sometimes you don't always have to get it hundred percent right. You've got to get them like 80 to 90% of the way. Right. I think we have overrun by two minutes. My apologies. As always, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate everyone's time. Um, if you could please give me your feedback. I, I do literally cater these webinars based on your feedbacks and all the previous feedback that we've got. We've tried new things, done things, you know, tried polls and it's got good and bad feedback. We really, really, really 100% appreciate it. So um, thank you so much for everyone that's donated cases. It does really change the game for us. If you would like to um, donate a case and present a case, then do let us know because we would love for everyone to get involved and be part of the Collective Minds uh, family community and also all, and the main thing is to learn from each other, isn't it? Like, like I said, I don't always get it right and I'm learning from you guys as well. So I really appreciate it. So for me, from a bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you to Mexico, Ethiopia, like or Bahrain, you know, it's amazing how many people come from so many places. Thank you so much. And from me, goodbye, have a good evening and I'll see you on the next one. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Imran, as always. You know, really, really good webinar. And everyone in the chats, I think, uh, agrees with me. Uh, I sent the feedback evaluation form. I will send it again. Uh, please fill that out in order for us to provide better quality of, uh, webinars for you. And also for us to give you the CPD certificates because you actually get one from joining. Uh, thank you for everyone who has uh, uh, uploaded cases on the global community for Imran to view. And if you would like Imran to view your case, all you have to do essentially is upload a case to the global community and tag uh, Doc Lasker. 
and uh, we will put them into the collection. And uh, with that being said, uh, I wish you a very fantastic day, a continued day. It's very sunny here in Sweden, and I hope it's fun, uh, sunny where you are now. It was a lot of different countries now, so it's hard to hard to tell. But uh, anyway, have a good day, the rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next webinar. Okay, bye-bye.